The Tarrant County Master Gardener Association has partnered with the Tarrant Regional Water District to encourage water conservation. TRWD maintains four area lakes and pipelines needed to provide surface water to local water treatment plants so they can clean that water to meet drinking standards for our communities. They also work with many cities in Tarrant County, such as Fort Worth, Arlington, Mansfield, and many others to provide water conservation programs to the community. Conservation is an important water supply strategy to help meet the needs of our growing population. There are currently 2.3 million people living in Tarrant County and is expected to double over the next 50 years. At SaveTarrantWater.com, you can sign up for free weekly watering advice custom to your location. If you're a resident of Tarrant County, you can sign up for a free sprinklers checkup where a licensed irrigator comes to your home, provides a comprehensive evaluation of your system with recommendations to reduce water waste. There's also an event calendar where you can find information about future classes and workshops. So be sure and check out SaveTarrantWater.com to sign up for their free services. Everybody, thank you for being here tonight. Um, you know, we are set to possibly break a record in our weather tomorrow. They're predicting we'll hit 80 degrees, which is pretty typical of our roller coaster weather here. I know it hasn't felt like winter or even fall some afternoons recently in my garden, but the meteorologists keep telling us we are now in meteorological winter. So our topic is definitely timely. And there we go. So when I think about winter prep in the garden, I don't actually think about winter. I start at the end. I start where I want to end up. And this photo is a picture of my garden, actually my backyard from June of this year, June of 2023. And when I look at this picture, I'm reminded of all the things I want to see again and again every year. But in order to make this happen, it requires that I do a lot of things in the fall and especially the winter too, because our winters have many days that are more fall-like. So I look at this and I see flowers and flowers are important to me. For a lot of reasons. I love them for the aesthetic beauty, but I love them for the pollinators. I look up towards the garden, which is the back of our property, and I see the pollinator beds lining the picket fence in front of the garden, and they're all pollinator beds. 99% of everything back there is native or adapted, and um, in the summertime when you walk up that way, you can't really hold a conversation when the bees are buzzing, the native bees and the honeybees, and it's just a delightful place to watch the butterflies and other insects. And then when I step through the gate into the garden itself in June, I'm just, sometimes I just stand there and I'm just awestruck by all the things that are happening and growing up there. So I want to get things done now to ensure that that happens next year. Kind of think of this as that photo that sometimes you'll hear or see people put on a refrigerator when they go on a weight loss program or, or a fitness improvement program, they put a picture on the refrigerator of how they want to look at the end of their journey. And this is how I want to look. I, I want the garden to look. I wouldn't mind looking like a flower either, but anyway, so some of the things I definitely want to be able to see and harvest next year are garlic. I grow hard neck garlic. I grow early German and music varieties. They do really well for me. And the picture on the far left shows the garlic drying on a drying rack in the garage. And we are still enjoying the garlic that was harvested in, in June. I definitely want to have beautiful onions like this. I grow a short day onion from Dixon Dale Farms. They're in South Texas, and I order from them, get my onion starts every January, and they are definitely a crop that is planted early, um, early in the year, so a winter planted crop here. You do protect them, and I'll show you a picture later. And then carrots, oh my goodness, we like carrots. And I plant carrots from late summer through November, depending upon what I'm planting them in. And then I start planting them again in February. And this particular 
small bunch of carrots were the last carrots I pulled out in June last year, and they actually were growing in a grow bag. Carrots do very well in grow bags as long as you've got good soil. So this is where I want to be again, like I said. And I mentioned pollinator beds up at the back of the uh, at the back of the yard in front of them, the garden fence. This picture in the middle uh, is a picture of the first pollinator bed we planted. It was sort of an experiment to see how things would go. And it was planted in 2019 and it has flourished. By late summer, most years, the plants are taller than the four foot picket fence and it, they're just covered in pollinators. Um, to the left, passion vine, the Gulf fritillary caterpillars just adore this plant. They will inhale it, but they never manage to eat it all the way to the ground. And it keeps, it, I had a, a bloom on it uh, just about three weeks ago, again, in one of our warm snaps. And then to the right, my grandmother always told me, plant enough herbs for yourself and for them, them being the caterpillars, the butterfly caterpillars, she said. And um, so swallowtail caterpillar on dill here, I scattered dill throughout the garden. And in order to make sure that I have enough dill and parsley, that involves starting plants in the wintertime on my growing station inside. So some of the things that I want to make sure come true, these are what these pictures are. So there's a concept called backward design. And I have begun applying it into the garden. When I was uh, studying for my master's in 2005, we were introduced to this concept. The book is listed at the title. It's called Backward by Design. And it was originally created as a way to uh, achieve as the results you wanted in, in the classroom. And so often that meant you know, ensuring that children passed, passed the test, passed whatever. But I found that the concept applied to so much in life. If you have an end goal where you want to end up and then you walk backwards mentally and delineate those steps that you need to take to get there and then move forward with those steps, it, it just made her perfect sense to me. And I discovered I was applying this in the garden even before I really realized what I was doing. So simply put, that means I want, again, that picture that I showed you, those pictures. That's what I want. Those are my expectations and my desired results in my garden of, from, for 2024. The supplies that I need, I need to be sure I'm very clear. Do I need more seed? No, I have lots of seed. But doesn't mean I won't buy anymore. Well, I need transplants. How many of X, how many different plants will I need to grow? For example, how many dill plants? How many parsley plants? A lot. Are the tools that I've been using in great shape? Do I need to replace, repair any of them? And the activities, the activities are where the exercise comes in. There's lots of steps that I'll take. And then throughout the entire process of thinking and planning and making lists. Again, steps, being real clear. I have a tendency to uh, get sidetracked and I come back to my list, but if I keep it in steps, I, I just perform much more efficiently in the garden. And then reflecting, I often reflect as I fall asleep at night and I'm going over what I've accomplished in the garden during the day. Uh, and it's a satisfying process. So again, beginning at the end, this is up in the garden itself. And on the left, tomatoes are growing in a raised bed. The tomato in front of the solar digester is um, my favorite new tomato plant. It's called Principi Borghese. It's an Italian tomato and it's uh, not tiny. It's larger than a cherry tomato, but it's a tomato that you grow strictly to dehydrate. And I have to tell you, honestly, when you take a bite of the first one that you've dehydrated, it's the best tasting sun-dried tomato I have ever eaten in my life. So it's great. I grew up five other different varieties of tomatoes, but this hands down was my favorite. It's a determinant plant. So that means its height is determined. It only grows to about five feet in height. And the tomatoes will come all ripe within a three-week window. 
So you're able to harvest half of them, dehydrate them, store them, and then get the rest. And then it's done. So, but it is a tomato. I definitely will be planting in January of 2024 insides because I want more. And then the photo on the right is just the very interior walkway of the garden. You'll notice there's a cat in the bird bath. It's another story. But if you look carefully in the small bed to the left, you'll see there's kale. That's kale that was started in February. And again, this is a June. So that was started in February. Um, and it is on its last legs, like most brassicas here in North Texas. As the temperatures warm up, they tend to really struggle and they draw pests in. Um, you're going to get a lot of cab uh, cabbage worms and um, just aphids. And I had had these still growing here as a trap crop to pull insects away from my tomatoes on the other side. Um, so I definitely will be starting a lot of kale. We eat a lot of kale and freeze a lot of kale. But it's it serves many purposes. It feeds me. It feeds the pest. It keeps the pest from eating my other plants. Great quote. Wish I'd said it. So how you prepare your garden for winter plays a huge role in how your garden will perform and produce next year. Uh, almost all of my presentations will feature this chart in some, some state. Depending upon the time of year, it may be barely filled out. This time of year, I've got entries going down into late November. I have this on the side of our refrigerator. This is my third year to use it. It's just a stick-on whiteboard that I can clean off. At the end of the year, I take pictures throughout the year in case somebody were to accidentally bump it and erase it. That would be terrible for me. But if you look over in the column that says first, you'll notice on January the 10th of this year, 2023, sunflowers are sprouting all over the garden. And that reminds me that we had a warm spell um, early, early in the year. To accomplish the first entry is start tomatoes by 125.23 and moving over to completed on 121.23, I started six varieties of tomatoes indoors. And successes, this was a very, very successful year for me in the garden. Uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but um, you'll notice there's really only one sad face on the whole chart. And being an elementary teacher, I use happy faces and sad faces. It's just, it's probably in my DNA now. But my year three asparagus bed was awesome. We had 11 harvests this year and it, they were tremendous. And the next one, the sugar snap peas, we ate so many of them out in the garden that we had to really work hard to bring any inside. So this is just a helpful tool for me. And I reference it. I go back in my photographs and reference it. I have to enlarge it, but it's just a simple, simple tool. So instead of a garden journal, I keep it on the refrigerator. All right. So like with so many things in life, before you get started, you have to clean up. And so before you get started on all the things you need to do for the winter garden, you need to assess what you need to do. What you need to do will be different than what I need to do. It's a good time to make a list, but your lists are going to be based exactly on your expected results. What is it that you want to see in your late winter, early spring, late spring, early summer garden? And once you have that more clear in your mind, grab your coffee or your beverage of choice to get to work because there is work involved. This graphic is a great one because it reminds all of us that there's a lot going on under the soil with our plants. And at this point in time, it's here because one of the first decisions you make when you're cleaning up your garden, whether it's raised beds or in ground, are you going to totally remove your plants? Or are you going to flush cut them. And flush cut is simply cutting them off at the soil line. I choose flush cutting about 90% of the time for a lot of reasons. The only plants I typically totally pull out will be tomatoes and okra. Um, I'm looking for root knot nematode damage. And also the roots are just so big, especially on my uh, okra plants, excuse me, that I said it if I said asparagus, I meant okra. Um, on my okra place, the roots are so big that they um, can become problematic. 
And so I also pull out disease plants and those often tend to be tomato plants and sometimes kale and collards. So other than that, I leave most of the plants roots in the ground and I cut them off and over to the right, that's our, my asparagus bed. And you'll notice in the picture that um, this was last week, it, everything was starting to turn yellow. It's even more yellow this week. And the asparagus bed will be flush cut to the soil line. I will add compost to it. I'm going to plant a cover crop over it. I'll plant field peas on top of it and then I'll mulch it and put a watering grid back on top and I'll water it periodically to help the cover crop get started and we'll move on. And I'll talk about cover crop, cover crops more in a minute. So a new practice for me this year is called chop and drop. It's not a new practice. It's new to me. The bed to the left is the one that you saw in the previous picture that had all the okra, zinnias, basil, all that stuff in it. And as I was cleaning out these beds, I just took the plants and piled them in the walkway. And then I came back and started chopping. And literally you chop things and you drop them and leave them there. And so I've gone back now and covered this with mulch and it is really starting to break down. I've been very pleased. So we'll see. I don't know if anything will sprout or not. There's heavy cardboard underneath. We'll find out. Experimenting can be fun. And oh my goodness, y'all. To me, one of the best benefits of gardening this time of year, of preparing things, are leaves. Leaves are beautiful. These are three different trees that happen to be in my yard, and I love them for many reasons. Of course, in the fall, their color is delightful, but one of the best benefits as the leaves fall for me is to gather them up and then to carry them up to the garden with the intention of using them as mulch to help retain moisture all winter long. And I know a lot of you would remind me that you can leave your leaves on the ground and mow them and you absolutely can. They'll provide nutrients for the for your lawn, the soil. But I have so many garden beds that I really need all the help I can get with mulch. And so I purchase mulch, I purchase straw a lot to use. And then I have to say leaves are my favorite mulch in garden beds because they will decompose and again provide nutrients to the soil. So while I'm cleaning, I'm also organizing and storing supplies. I don't know about y'all, but as I'm busy in the spring and summer when I'm fertilizing things and using weed killer on in between pavers, because that's the only place I'll use that vinegar, things get a little messy. I drip, tops don't get put on correctly, Things can get knocked over and spilled. So before I put these things away for next spring, I just kind of take a wet cloth and clean everything up, make sure the tops are really screwed on tight. And then and they're stored in a shelf up above this, this table in the garden shed. It's kind of like packing away my summer clothes in a different way. Well, sometimes I end up wearing, unfortunately, fish emulsion. Ugh. So um, anyway. I also, at this time of year, am pulling out all of the garden's uh, support system. I'll pull out temporary fencing sometimes around tall, lanky flowers. I'm pulling out lots of garden stakes, pulling out pepper trellises and tomato trellises if I haven't already done so. And this is a great time to inspect them. I'm looking for rust. I'm looking for breakage or bent legs, seeing if they can be repaired with duct tape. Whatever, whatever they need. I rinse everything off, let it dry, and then I store them in a in a system or a storage rack system back behind the garden shed, and they're ready for next year. And by taking a few minutes to check everything, I'm able to reuse all these supplies over and over. And then I have a few unusual things that I have to clean up because I garden with six garden cats and many, many squirrels. I go through a lot of plastic garden forks. They really help to deter digging. Um, nobody seems to like to get in planters or pots or in garden beds where I have the plastic forks. So that works great. I just pull them out, rinse them off. I toss all the ones that are yellowing because they're already starting to break down from the sun. 
but you can buy a box of 600 forks fairly inexpensively from some of the big box stores. And that'll last many, many years. I was able to find time just early earlier this week to finally go back out to the garden, pull out garden solar lights, and then, you know, sometimes fire ants will build nests up inside them, able to clean out the globe part, and then either pull out the rechargeable batteries and put them on the charger or replace others. And so it's just little mundane tasks like that that I don't have time to, to deal with until this time of year. Of course, tool maintenance is critical and sometimes it gets overlooked. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that those little scissors on the side were left out in the rain for, I don't know how long, I'd lost them, found them in the yard. And um, uh, so we're going to see if I can get the rest off and sharpen them up. I know that I can get the plant goop off the hand pruners and the, the snips and, and sharpen those blades and they'll be good to go. Uh, they've been my two of my go-tos for quite a long time. Another thing to do right now, if you have the time, and you may have more time now, like I said, than you will in the spring or, or the summer, come up with an organization system that works for you. It can't work for anybody but you. If you do better by putting all your garden tools in a bag or in a in a heavy bucket with sand and mineral oil, whatever works for you, that's what you need to do. There's nothing more frustrating than having a task that you need to do and you cannot find the pruners or the, the spade or whatever it is that you need. So I use the pegboard system. I also hang clipboards out there with notes to myself on things I need to get done. And it's always fun to check off my list. I find winter to be a good time to replace beds, if that's your choice, and or to build new beds. Um, the bed on the left was a cedar bed that had started rotting at the bottom, and so I pulled it out. And we've now replaced all the beds in the garden with steel beds. It's been a, a two-year process. And the bed on the right, it's the same bed as the, that one on the left, but you'll note I had to sculpt it going from a square bed to a round bed. And then I pulled plants out. And once I got the bed set up, I pulled out the bee balm and oregano that were in there, added soil, and, and transplanted everything back in. And the bed has done well for two years. So speaking of adding soil, if you ask a gardener, someone who's gardened a long time, what the most important thing in the garden is, I know my answer is always going to be the soil. If, if my soil has issues, it's not going to matter how much I spend on seeds, plants, no matter how high my water bill is, how much I spend on tools, if my soil needs to be right to start with. And, and to, to check on your soil, you can test it. You can test it and you can send it to A&M um, and, um, and have it tested. You can do private testing. You can even buy a little, um, last Christmas I was given a little gadget that you can just stick in your soil and it just checks for the first three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But it, it, it gives you a quick readout and just tells you about those three. It's important to know the other micronutrients, you know, from calcium on, but testing your soil, it's like giving you a baseline. And so let's say your soil's great, or your soil's needy. That's going to be like the flow chart you follow with the next steps. Most beds, most raised beds, will need to have soil added. Um, soil can get compacted. And I do add soil if needed, but I always, always, always amend soil. Compost is just, uh, compost is kind of after, after soil compost. Those are my two favorite things to talk about in the garden. Um, and so I add compost and then planting cover crops is done to improve your soil. If you have garden uh, rows or beds that are going to lie fallow that you're not planting anything in, planting cover crops in them will make a huge difference in, in 
next year's production. It'll get you to that image you're, you're thinking about for next summer. And then, of course, mulching. We all know the importance of mulch. Mulch not only keeps the soil moist, the plants moist, keeps you from having to water quite as often, it eventually will break down and add some nutrients. So improving soil, critical. We um, have soil delivered in bags. Um, just our property is on a huge slope and it's just very difficult to get up and down with wheelbarrows. And so we have pallets delivered with, I always get organic compost. I cannot always find organic potting soil. So it just depends on what's available. But it's always a happy day when the soil arrives for us. Well, I say for me. All right, I talked about cover crops. Again, we're still working on improving soil. So cover crops have been grown a long time in agriculture and big farming. And the reason for that is they do exactly what their name implies. They are a crop that is grown to cover the soil. But they do more than just provide a living mulch. Red clover, white clover, and field peas are legumes. And um, they have a lovely benefit of, as the plants grow, they, I always imagine little hands coming out, they grab nitrogen from the air and the nitrogen travels through the plant into the roots where the nitrogen is then fixed in the soil. So you hear them called nitrogen fixers. And that nitrogen in the soil then is available to be used by the next crop of plants that you grow in that bed. So for example, I have had great luck planting tomatoes in beds that had clover or field peas growing in them. The same with cucumbers, uh, the same with uh, peas. My snap peas were very happy this year to grow in a bed that had field peas growing in it last year. I also grow oats, buckwheat, and hairy vetch. And these are not the only cover crops available. These are the ones that I grow and that I have experience with. And right now I have all six of these planted in um, 11 different beds up in the garden. So hairy vetch, oats and, and buckwheat will grow and they can sometimes be frost killed. Um, I, I, they were frost killed for me in 2021. They were not frost killed last year. So whether they continue to grow or not, even if they're frost killed, their roots are still below the soil and they are adding nutrients that way too. And one of the benefits of all of these is they break up compacted soil too. So they do a lot of work for you. And the process of planting them is real simple. You know, I add compost to the, the beds. I simply stand and just kind of like the way I imagine I would throw out chicken feed if I were feeding my chickens. Um, I just strew the seeds on top of the bed and I literally cover with mulch at that point. I don't even plant, put soil on top. So it is a quick and easy process. And I do have uh, irrigating uh, drip irrigation watering grids that I put down and water them two to three times a week to get them started and then back off to twice a week. And they are happy. I believe we have a picture. Yep. So here's a picture on the left of Field, I know it's hard to see, but those are field peas up to where you can see the seeds up towards the back of top, the top of the picture. And then in the middle, those are clover uh, seeds coming up through the leaf mulch. And then on the right, I planted these a little early because I knew I wanted a picture to have <laughs> to be able to show people. Um, these were planted in... Um, early November, and they sprouted quickly. These are field peas on either side of the garlic growing in the middle of this bed. And you can see that gar gardening uh, water grid that's in the middle, and it waters out on all four sides of the, of the pipe of the conduit. But um, this will continue growing, and field peas can produce crops, and you can eat them. I just choose not to. I want all the energy to be in, and so, the one thing I do try to do is I trim the, once they start flowering, I trim the tops. At the end of what I think their growing season is going to be, because I'm ready to get plants in the garden, I literally will take a weed eater and whack 
them to the ground, or if I'm worried about hitting the watering grids, I do it by hand. And then I just drop them in the bed until I'm ready to come back and pull them to the side and make um, rows to plant in. But if you haven't tried cover crops, I really encourage you to give it a shot. Compost. Remember I said that we buy compost. I have uh, 23 beds up in the garden. And so I never can produce enough compost. There's just no way unless I worked at it full time. So I buy compost. This is mushroom compost. I've been using it for 10 years. I started using it in Arkansas. And um, the big box store, well, actually it's Lowe's that carries this one. And it's just, it's the substrate left from mushroom growing by professional mushroom growers. And I've had really good luck with it. And um, then over on the right is part of my compost system. I have a bunch of different bays. They fill up at different times. I will normally sort and sift it in the late winter, early spring. I also stockpile bags of leaves when I can find them. These came from my son's yard last year, and I just used up the last of them a few weeks ago. So I'm going to be on the hunt for more leaves. I mentioned earlier about planting onions in this time of year. So we've moved on from having our soil ready to nitty gritty of growing things. And onions do well when planted. Onions, shallots planted in um, January here, February at the latest. But notice that there is a zip up. It's kind of a cold frame slash mini greenhouse that fits in these smaller beds. And this worked beautifully for me. Got snowed on, didn't matter. I just kept it covered and then opened it up on sunny days. This is a great time to plant trees if you're considering it. These are trees that the Master Gardeners actually um had an Arbor Day event and these were raffled off to attendees. But um the great thing about planting trees this time of year is you get them in the ground, they get adjusted to the native soil, and their roots have a have a several months to really start spreading and the trees are really getting settled in so that once spring arrives, they have a head start on a tree that's not planted until February or March. This time of year also, of course, if anybody's been growing things from previous seasons, you're going to continue growing. Lettuce does phenomenally here throughout the winter. I rarely cover it unless we're going to have a really terrific snow or ice event. Um, this bed on the right is one that this year I planted down by the garden and we will be eating on the kale and the chard and this and the um, collards probably until April. Um, I have had some pest pressure in this bed, especially cabbage worms, because again, we've gotten warm, but um, that's okay. We, still have had a lot of good leaves out of it. And really, you know, the only thing you need to do with things that have been growing, there's an herb bed right behind it. Just make sure that you've topped it off with some compost and apply more mulch and just keep it adequately watered. This time of year, you can actually still plant some bulbs. You can still plant daffodil bulbs and you can put amaryllis in the ground now. And um, the rewards are always worth it in the spring when those the, er, the early ones really pop up from daffodils to crocus to high grape hyacinth and on. I pull out my elephant ear uh, bulbs. So on the, on the right, mine are all grown in big containers and not in the ground. I know people tell me that they leave theirs in the ground all the time here and they always come back. And some people have told me they leave them in containers. I just choose not to. Um, we're always colder than the airport in the winter and airport temperature. And so we'll hit freezing up in the garden when, you know, it's not freezing downtown or other places. And so 
I pull out my elephant ear bulbs. I need to, I'll cut these back down shorter, obviously, and then cut the stalks down and then remove as much soil as possible. And then they get stored in the garage from November, December uh, until May when I bring them out and pot them up. Most important thing I think in gardening this time of year and just getting your garden ready for the spring is to be ready for anything. This was our front yard um, last year in 2022. And it's just important to be prepared ahead of time. And one of the best things you can do is to invest in some mini greenhouses and cold frames. Um, you can see on the left, these are carrots that were growing last winter. This was last January. And they had been planted in September of last year. And um, in fact, remember the carrot picture that I showed you early on that I said I harvested in June, they came out of a similar grow bag setup. They were just planted a little bit later. But carrots flourished all winter long. I would unzip, roll up on good days, zip up and leave them be on cold days. And I invested in these cold frames on the right last year. And I'm, I'm so glad I did. Um, I got all these, they're all set up again. Um, I, these were set up the weekend of Halloween this year, because do you remember we knew we were going to have freezes. So we got down to 31 and then 29 the next night. And so this was just this week. And I still have a beautiful basil plant growing in one of those and some other plants that I wanted just to have a little extra protection. And it's up against the back wall of the house. So it gets that um, heat, the radiant heat effect too, to keep it warm. And they work beautifully. This is just a simple little inexpensive uh, greenhouse from Aldi that I have set up in my garden. And again, right before Halloween, when we knew we were going to get a frost, I set it up and I put some pots in there. I had some elephant ears in small pots that were up in the garden. They never got real big, but they were extra bulbs. I just needed to plant them. But even today, and they, so this was, like I said, end of October. So even today, I still have mustard growing in there. My artichokes growing in there. Got a few herb rosemary plants just because they tend sometimes to freeze up in my garden when they don't freeze down by the house. So it's just a, another little safeguard that I put into place when we're not having right before we get terrible weather. So frost cloth and hoops, really important. On the left, you'll see at the south end of the beds, the hoops are in place. There are four hoops that run down. These are 10 foot beds. And I have the frost cloth just tucked in and clipped so it doesn't blow around waiting to be used. And I got that set up a few days before we had a freeze and by the way this was in 2021 which should trigger all kinds of memories um so we started having uh frost at night and i would cover them and then right before snowmageddon hit us i um I had just been leaving the covers in place and i didn't lose any plants all in these two beds i promise you i didn't i think i think the reason so they were covered with frost cloth but we had a nice snow that was insulating before we got all that ice and more snow. So I think that that truly made a difference. If these had not been covered, they would have died. And this is um, beets, carrots, Swiss chard, arugula, and dinosaur kale in that bed and some spinach. And I, they all lived. I think that, that prior planning made a difference. Oh, speaking of planning, so these are actual lists from 2022 and 2023. I I do better if I write things down and then I love being able to check them off. And you'll notice everything from what I wanted to direct sow in 2023 to what I needed to do, what I was going to trim and cut back, what I needed to divide. I have notes from a tomato virtual presentation I watched with um, Callie Works Leary of the Dallas Garden School about tomatoes. It was really good. And then sketches of the garden. This was late winter, early spring in 2022 and, and so on. So I save lists because, again, I can go back and look at them to help me get to where it is I want to be going. 
I do make a master map of my garden and I know that I could do a much cleaner, fancier one online. I just originally did one on lined paper and I think it's quaint. I don't know. It makes me think of my grandmother somehow. And so I just update it every, every season and I always write in pencil. I've got the basic outline that I can just fill in. And again, I've got those cover crops listed on here. The one thing I don't, I don't see, oh, I just have clover written once because I have two kinds of clover, but you'll notice where the garden shed is, where the, where the long beds are. And we've added more beds than some of the pictures and then everything in here is what I've got going on right now. And this is so simple to do. It helps me to plan. So seed starting, I mentioned earlier, I start seeds inside. These were tomatoes uh, that had been started in January of 2022. And in this picture, you'll notice it says they were started on 125. And then some of the, the sticks say 216. That's when I potted them up or bumped them up. And they were doing really well. And that was on the grow station on the left. And this was in our back room. And it worked beautifully. It was great. And then we got a cat in <laughs> late summer 2023. And she was uh, an outdoor rescue. And she loved soil. So I could no longer start seeds inside. I moved the grow station out to our garage, which is insulated, which is a lovely bonus. And it exploded. And this was how my grow station looked in January, February of this year, 2023. I was ambitious. All right. So that's in a nutshell, kind of, sort of, how to prepare your garden now so that you'll have a great, great harvest and kind of maybe have your dreams come true in the spring. What I would say now for those things that you do plant and grow this winter, if you are growing things, and by the way, knowing we're going to be 80 degrees tomorrow, you can certainly put transplants out and just make uh, preparations to keep them covered, maybe with a cold frame or a, or a mini greenhouse. Uh, right now, I'm harvesting radishes, kale, Swiss chard, collard greens, spinach, green onions, lettuce, herbs. My spinach has started bolting because we've had too many um warm days but that's okay um just be sure again that you've like i said earlier topped them all with compost mulch them and water them well and to end going back to the concept of backward design in the garden if you're thinking ahead to 2024 imagine yourself standing outside gazing at the garden you desire it's not going to look like my in my desire. It's going to look like your desire. And so these are the questions I would ask you. What do you expect to see? What do you want to harvest or enjoy in this future garden? How are you going to get there? What new techniques, materials, ideas do you need to achieve your goals? Will planning and creating a master map of the garden help you to reach your expectations? And will re record keeping aid in success, aid your success in the garden? And with that, we're ready for questions. Okay, Cheryl. You ready? Yes. Okay. How do you get plant goop off and off of your tools and, and sharpen them? Okay. So we have master gardeners that are excellent people to answer that question, but this is what I do. I spray WD-40 on a <laughs> lot of my tools. Let it sit for a little bit, and then I will use steel wool. I will use, um, there's a company that makes these really heavy-duty sponges. There's a big, there's a daddy one and a mama one, and I'm blank at the moment. They're a smiley face. They're round and have a smiley face in them, and I get them at Target. They're really stiff if you don't put them in water, and they work really well, too. I use those for uh, scrubbing out bird baths, and then to sharpen them, I honestly have a, um, uh, what's it called? A whetstone that was my great grandfather's uh, that I can wet and we put oil on it. And, or I have a lot of handheld files. So I'm not an expert, but that's what works for me. Okay. Uh, Michelle wants to know, where do you get your soil? Ah, okay. So Lowe's. 
Home Depot and Walmart all have different soils that, that I have used. My favorite lately, and I use, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, I use potting soil in my garden beds, not garden soil. So my favorite is miracle Grows Organic when I can find it, or Better Homes and Gardens Organic. Walmart carries the Better Homes and Gardens. Lowe's has the, um, and Ace Hardware too, have the um, miracle Grow Organic. If I can't get those, I can get miracle Grow pretty much anywhere, just regular miracle Grow potting soil. Are there any any tips on how to fill multiple beds, multiple raised beds? So, um, you know, when you're starting off, let's say you've got a 12 inch bed. You know, some depending on what you're growing, you could probably uh, with annuals and things and some of the annual vegetables um, that don't have deep roots. You could even start by using a technique called hugel culture there's different ways to pronounce it it's h-u-g-e-l-k-u-l-t-u-r and it's where you put you can put garden debris in the bottom of the bed such as branches and spent plants just make sure there's no roots and cardboard all kinds of things like that and then top it with soil so you it will compact down though so know that you, when you do that and that the material at the bottom will decompose know that in subsequent seasons you'll still need to top it off of course it could be cheaper if you have the ability to have soil delivered by the truck loader to go pick it up that's not going to be as expensive as bag soil we just have an issue with the steep grade going up to the garden and um, my husband and i are getting old <laughs> do you test your soil once a year or more often I don't test mine every year. I test it every other year. I, you know, I mentioned the little gadget I was given last year in a stocking stuffer, and I can't think what company makes it, but it's a, the the person who gave it to me said they got it on Amazon and it was a, a soil tester. It's a probe. And like I said, it only indicated uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. But um, I used that this year instead of testing and all but, I think three beds had the right levels of nitrogen and the beds that didn't have the right levels of nitrogen. I did not grow cover crops in last year. So that was one of those like, aha. So, you know, I think I'm doing best practice and um, that, that helps a lot. When we moved here five years ago, when we, we moved back to Texas from Arkansas, I test had the soil tested and our soil we're in uh, Southwest Fort Worth. Our soil is not good. That's being nice. It is not good. It's very, very alkaline. So that's why I grow in raised beds. Okay. Um, do you plant cover crops in dormant perennial beds? No, I don't. I just mulch those beds. I I I, I throw compost out as best I can, and and I and I mulch a little bit more if they need mulch. My beds are pretty full, so I have a hard time getting mulch in there this time of year and I don't cut them back totally because I like to leave that cover in those beds you know for um wildlife so that is the one area that I do a little more work in the spring and we're late winter honestly in late February if we're not in the middle of a snowstorm or ice storm I'm out trimming things around Valentine's Day in the perennial beds okay Tony wants to know, do you have a list of garden seeds, plants, and plants that do well for you here? Or at least the tomato plants you mentioned? I can tell you the tomato plants right now that have done really well for me. Um, they're not all um, heirloom. I will, I will say this. In Arkansas, I grew a lot of heirloom tomatoes, and they did very, very well. Heirloom tomatoes can struggle here in that they're not as disease resistant. But in a minute, I'll tell you the trick I learned in the last two years to help with that. I grow, like I said, the Principi, it's, it's, it's Italian. So Principi Borghese, it's uh, B-O-R-G-H-E-S-E. -E. That's the sun-dried one. Uh, celebrity, um, 
slicer tomatoes do really well here. I have really good luck with green zebra. They are an heirloom, but they're not a, a, a big slicer. And other than that, I have really struggled with other slicers. Cherry tomatoes, I would I, I was getting yellow pear cherry tomatoes uh, off the plant three weeks ago. Uh, so uh, but a Hold lot of a okay. Sun gold does great. It's a cherry tomato. Um, I'm trying to think. I also grew Rutgers last year and they did well. And oh, oh, I, how can I forget this one? Mexico Midget is a new to me. I've only grown it three times. So that makes it a newer one. Mexico Midget is an, is an heirloom. They say that it's current size, you know, so it'd be about the size of your little fingernail. It grows much bigger here. Um, it's when I say much bigger, it's more like the size of your thumb, but it, uh, it's one of the, the indeterminate ones that the vines get 20, 25 feet long and it produces until either bugs just decimate it or till you have a frost. So those are the ones that have done so well for me. I know that there are people that will tell you they can grow heirlooms without any trouble. I just have struggled with it here. But what I started doing this year is growing a lot more trap crops. And that's a whole different presentation. But a trap crop is something you plant far away from the desired crop. So the bugs will go to the trap crop. And what I learned to plant is, is ornamental millet. So millet is a grain. It's in bird seed. And um, it is absolutely the favorite plant I have found of Florida leaf bugs and stink bugs. And they will go just infest the millet, which is fine because I had it growing 15 feet away from all my tomatoes. And um, so that helped, I think, too, with keeping that yellow pear going and all the others. Hope that helps. Yeah. Do you, do you have a place where they could get that list of garden seeds and plants that do well here? I could make a list and we could, could we uh, then email it out to them yeah you could have it you know you could have it sent to all the registrants you know people okay. have registered yes okay i'm making a note to myself i will let you know what grows really well for me like i said i'm in southwest fort worth so cheryl if you will generate that list and just send it to me and then i can forward it to the uh, attendees i will i won't get to it till this weekend if that's okay y'all that's okay okay super okay Mary Lou wants to know, do artichokes freeze here in North Texas? Yes, they do. They do. <laughs> and I haven't had real good luck, but um, I know some people have. And that's why I've got mine inside that little um, greenhouse and it has not frozen. So um, this is the first time I just I just grabbed an artichoke plant. I just wanted to see. We love artichokes. So it did not flower this year, which I've been told is not unusual. So we'll see if it's still with me next spring and I can let you know more then, but it has not frozen yet because it's got some extra coverage. Okay. Uh, where's, what's the best place to buy? Where's the best place to buy a raised bed? Oh my gosh. It depends on what you want to spend. Honestly, they're expensive. Um, the steel beds that I have gone with are from a company out of Houston called Vego. It's V-E-G-O. It rhymes with Lego, although we say Lego. But um, Birdie's beds are good, too. They're from Australia, but they're sold by a company in uh, California called Epic Gardening. I like the Vego beds. I like the fact that it was a Texas company, and they're, they last, they're guaranteed to last 20 years. And they can, I can put one together in my sleep. Now, I think we have 26 of them all together throughout the yard. But um, they, um, you pay up front. A lot of the steel beds, though, you can get some that aren't as pricey from Home Depot and Lowe's. And there's a, there's a company um, that I've used a lot with cedar beds called, it's, it looks like it's greens, but it's, they pronounce it green is G-R-E-N-N-E-S. And they make cedar bed kits um, and they uh, 
you slot them into a, a corner post and um, and then put a cap on them. And, and they worked fine until they just, the bottom rows started rotting. But um, I, I had them, I had some of them for eight years. I actually brought some with me from Arkansas. And, and that's how I started the garden here uh, at the end of 2018. But um, I, I, you know, I know Amazon has beds. Um, we've started a garden club at my mother's assisted living place and they ordered some raised cedar beds for me. And these are the ones to use with the residents. They're up on, you know, they're the, the beds that you could roll a wheelchair up to. So um, they were less than a hundred dollars. And I don't, I, I didn't see the actual price. She just told me they were less than a hundred dollars on Amazon. But I always look at reviews. Any place I order from, I read the reviews. So. Okay. Uh, Angela didn't quite catch the name of the tomato plant that you said you liked the best. Could you maybe type that into chat or something where she? Oh could yeah. See it? Let me let me escape from here. Yes. Let okay. me see if I can get up out of this. So. Let me move. Of course, you know, I have to figure. There I am. Yes, I could do that. Okay. It's I'll type them all. OK. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. And Alice will also wants to know the name of the Italian tomato you were talking about. Yeah, I just put it in there. OK. And it was just. It is so good that uh, the Principe Borghese, when you, um, I store mine by sun-dried tomatoes, though they're not sun-dried, they're dehydrated. I store them in the freezer and just in containers and I pop them out and toss them in with pasta and and they rehydrate and oh my stars, sorry. They just, it, it's like, it's like you're in summer again, if that makes any sense. Okay. So. All right. Um. Sarah would like to find out about cover crop more about cover crops. Do you know where she could get more information about those? Um, online. Honestly, it is one of the easiest things to, as we say, Google, and um, you will find more information than you ever have. Here's a, here's an example. If you grow squash, I haven't grown squash in the last three years here because we have a squash vine borers. And once they appear, they say they stay in the soil. But I'm actually going to try squash again next year because I'm going to plant blue Hubbard squash as a trap crop. And um, I found that information online. And then there is a great book. I'm going to turn around. The book, the book, the book. It is, the book is called Plant Partners. And like I said, this is a whole nother, as we say, a whole nother um, presentation but I don't mind so the book is um plant partners is by a woman named um Jennifer Walliser and Jessica Walliser and she spoke at the international master gardener um meeting this last year and uh she, throughout the book she goes through and talks about so there's companion planting and there's trap crop you can plant put plants together that benefit one another. You could put plants in your garden that will benefit, but they're not together. Like I said, the millet. And so my favorite trap crop again, this is what it's called. Ornamental millet. Hope that's helping. Okay. And Sarah also wants to know, where do you find the hoops for your frost cloth? Oh, Hudson. Well, uh, a lot of the the really good seed companies will will um, sell them. I got mine from Hudson Valley uh, Seed Company. They're in New York, but um, Johnny's sells hoops. Um, Johnny's uh, select seeds, and Amazon sells them. I have not seen them locally. I'm sure somebody has them. I just. Um, I got these, the ones I have from Hudson Valley Seeds, I got them the end of 2020 and because we had predicted that it was going to be a rough winter in 2021. <laughs> and so 
I pre-ordered and you can order frost cloth from them and they will cut it to length. I ordered 12 foot, uh, you know, pieces that were 12 feet long for those two beds and, and it worked beautifully. And I think they charge you. It's, I don't know how much a foot it's not, it's not bad, maybe a dollar a foot, but that you can probably find, you can probably find frost cloth locally. Yeah, you should be able to. Yeah. I mean, I've ordered it from Amazon too, uh, in subsequent years for other beds. Okay. Do you know any low cost ways to deter wildlife, such as deer and raccoons from ripping up your plants? Hmm. This is going to be hard to believe because I'm 65 years old, but I have never had a problem with deer. I have just managed to live. Where, so I don't have an answer on deer. And I'm sorry, even though we lived in Arkansas, we didn't have deer in our yard. It was fenced. Did that help? Maybe. Um, they tell me that fencing makes a difference with deer, but low cost, it's not low cost. Other wildlife. I do, I do two things. So when I start a brand new bed because of the garden cats, I lay down. You know, you can you see that orange construction fencing that they put up sometimes. It's uh, in a grid. It's plastic. I take sheets of that and cut it down and actually lay it on top of the bed and plant in between the grids. And when that's how I started my okra, uh, excuse me, my asparagus bed uh, the first year. And I planted the crowns and then the, the, the plants grew up between the little uh, triangular. No, they weren't diamond shaped. Um, openings and I did not have squirrels in that bed I didn't have raccoons because we do have raccoons here and um so that's really worked laying down and and that's cheap I mean you can get a roll of 100 feet I say cheap it's 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 cheaper than a lot of other methods um because you'll you'll see garden companies selling expensive mesh to put down uh, you can put they talk about putting chicken wire down, but I want my plants to grow a little more freely than that. So I've, and I've reused that construction fencing many years. And what's nice about it, once your plants are really established, you can take your garden shears, uh, scissors and, and cut that uh, mesh out and pull it out and recycle it if you need to. Okay. Michelle says, thank you very much. This has oh, been yeah. wonderful. Uh, yeah. She said Costco sometimes has miracle Grow organic potting soil. Ah, good. And she good said she'll, she'll be sure and get a lot of it next time she goes. I really like it. It um, My my planters and, and big pots loved it this year. It's, it's good stuff. Um, Adrian says she's just moved here from Canada. Oh, boy. And very excited to have a garden. And you, do you know where she can buy a dwarf magnolia tree? Oh, yes. Archie's. Um, Archie's Garden Land. I bought, well, I say dwarf. I bought um, a little gem magnolia there in October of 2019. And it's gone from about six feet to 12 feet. And that's supposed to be its height. It's, it will spread wider, but it's done beautifully. Is it like the teddy bear or which one is it? It's little Jim, little, little Jim, Jim. Mag yeah. little okay. Jim. Yeah. So it's yeah. a smaller one. Um, but Archie's is my go-to place for trees in Fort Worth. That's good. Yeah. They, yeah, they have nice stuff. They do. Um, someone said that they didn't see anything about the Italian tomato in the chat. Okay, it is. It's the first one I listed. It's Principi Borghese. Um, I, I put Principi Borghese, Rutgers, Yellow Pear, Green Zebra, Celebrity. Did they not see that list? Let's see here. I, I see it. Yeah. Okay. I can type it again. I don't see that one, though. I, I don't. Oh, Principi Borghese was at the top. That's weird. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's at the very top. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. I bought that seed based on recommendations. I bought that actually from Hudson Valley Seeds. Um, that's one of my go-to. Oh, thank you, Nancy. That's one of my go-to um, seed companies. Even though they're based in New York, they, uh, they sell um, heirloom seeds and... Um, 
a lot of the plant vloggers that I follow on YouTube buy seeds from them. They buy seeds from Baker Creek and Johnny's too. And, you know, the, the and botanical interest is another great seed company. And so I tend to buy my seeds from companies like that instead of locally, just because of the variety. And that's why I love seed starting in January. January, you know, I'm not really out in the garden much other than checking on the cover crops and things and maybe harvesting some greens. But it's exciting to go out and just have your seed packets out there with, it, you know, wherever your grow station is and just get started. It's a fun process. Uh, Nancy, se several people said they can't see chat and wants to know if it's disabled or something. Oh, no, it should be enabled. because I mean, I just sent it to everyone. I did change some of the messages was just to the panel, but it now says everyone. It and, they still be okay. and they still not see it. Yeah, mine's all showing host and panelists. Oh, wonder. OK, I see the problem. I didn't even look to see who it was going to. Yeah, but it should be now to everyone, though. Yes, you sent it to everyone this time. There we go. OK. OK. Sorry, y'all. We've got a couple of people that raised their hands. Uh, and, and they uh, should be able to unmute. Yeah. Um, Dick, I did change that. Yeah. M MJ, you can unmute yourself. Should be able mm -hmm. to. Yeah. I forgot to take my video. Start my video. And you can ask your question. MJ, you there? Unmute yourself, please. They could have accidentally hit the... Yeah, 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 maybe so. Okay. I think that's all the questions I see. Let me double check again. Oh, what was the Mexico to, uh, tomato? Wasn't it something? Oh, yes, midget? yes, yes. Let me. It's Mexico midget. Let me make sure this goes to everyone. And. Again, it just had really good reviews. So I thought, you know what? I grew it for the first time last year. And it just did so well that I grew it um, last, last spring, last fall, and this spring. Okay. All right. Well, that's all of them, I think. You did okay. a great job. All right. Thank y'all. Really did.